Good afternoon, and on behalf of Red Cloud, I'd like to welcome all of those listening in. A reminder that Red Cloud hosts weekly webinars on a variety of mining related topics. Our live attendance today is a record and we anticipate attendance to also set records in the next several days on replay. Also remember that at any time during the live presentation, you can submit a question through your web browser and we'll do our best, David and I will do our best to get to as many of them as we can. I'd especially like to thank David Rosenberg, founder, chief economist, strategist of Rosenberg Research and Associates for leading this webinar today with Red Cloud. By way of background, for those who may not be aware, David Rosen is a renowned chief economist and strategist from both Wall Street and Bay Street, with prominent roles at both Merrill Lynch and Glutson's Chef spanning the past 20 years. David, before we kick off the official webinar, I was hoping you'd provide us with a brief background on your recent move to create Rosenberg and Associates. Right, well, I think that um, what most people don't know is that I was actually operating a research business uh, for outside clients, even when I was at Glusman Chef for the past 10 years. And uh, I have 2,100 subscribers in 40 different countries uh, who are actually buying uh, my research. And I just thought, you know, it was time at 59 years old, uh, soon to turn 60, adding another zero, uh, that it was time to just take this private uh, and provide independent, unique, thought-provoking research uh, that is going to help clients uh, save money and make money. And so for me, it was just a case after, you know, 35 years of working on the buy side and the sell side of the business. And the reality is that if you're an economist or strategist uh, at a big financial institution, uh, you really have to formulate uh, your uh, thesis publicly in a way that's consistent with how your company is positioned, the or house. you have to help them pitch product. The house. So now I just have to basically just pitch my view uh, I've always been trained and actually you said earlier that Don Cox was your last strategist that you had on and he was a mentor of mine uh, and actually taught me uh, at a very young age uh, that they really the mark of a marquee economist on Bay Street or Wall Street or whatever street is to take your economic data points, connect the dots to the financial markets and find a way to develop uh, a unique and relevant cogent coherent investment strategy uh, for your client base. And so that's what we attempt to do at uh, at Rosenberg Research. Uh, we have I've staffed up with uh, with uh, four economists and a research assistant. So we have the heft, and we're doing everything from uh, from technical analysis uh, to fundamental strategy, uh, speeches, conference calls, uh, daily write ups, weekly write ups. So uh, whatever it is that people want to hear from us, we'll do for you. And it's all aimed at um, at uh, at helping. Uh, portfolio managers, CIOs, individual investors, uh, to help them uh, in their quest uh, to maximize their... I would just say that many of our Red Cloud individuals, including myself, uh, signed up and have, have trialed your, your, your work, and we love it, and we use it uh, regularly here. Well, I, I appreciate that very much. So, uh, so to, to begin our webinar, although we are mining-focused, uh, I thought it'd be best to provide a little macroeconomic background prior to delving into your view of gold. So to begin, I recently read your Barron's article, a contrarian economist warning about recession and deflation. He's been right before, was the title of this Barron's article. Where, and this is whereby you provided a 2020 and beyond economic outlook a few weeks back. My question is, could you, could you talk a little bit about that outlook that you had coming into 2020 and how in the last few weeks with all of the coronavirus news and potential impact, how your outlook might have even changed further? Right. Well, uh, I'd already started detecting uh, a year ago uh, that global economic growth uh, was beginning to slow down. And of course, the big shock last year uh, was the trade war uh, between the U.S. and China, which really only got partially resolved, not totally resolved by phase one. Uh, and that this generated a recession actually in manufacturing, a recession in capital spending, and actually a three-quarter recession in profits. And I was saying all along uh, that the economy doesn't operate in a vacuum. There's leads and there's lags, and you don't shock capital spending and you don't shock corporate profits and manufacturing without it having some lagged impact on the consumer. So, of course, the coronavirus is an added supply and demand shock globally. 
uh, that is just reinforcing my view. Uh, I mean, you know that I've been bullish on gold, but at least as bullish on long-term treasuries. And uh, I was saying for a long time that the 10-year treasury note yield was going to get down below 1%. I just thought it would probably happen 12 months from now than, than the last couple of days. So, um, but my, my, my sense was that things are already slowing down. Uh, I know people say, well, but look at the U.S. consumer. The U.S. consumer admittedly uh, hung on remarkably well last year. That's 70% of U.S. GDP. Uh, but I did think that there was going to be a lagged impact on employment and then an impact on income in the consumer this year. And that's going to be, of course, exacerbated by what's happening in this coronavirus. This is going to affect people's behavior in terms of how they travel, their mobility, their willingness to go out into crowds. Uh, and it's already happening overseas and it'll happen over here as well. So I never really had to have a view that we had to have a huge recession. I just had to have a view that the economy globally, including the U.S., uh, that demand growth was going to slow below supply growth. And of course, economists are consumed with supply and demand curves. Uh, and that's important because it gives you a price. Uh, so I had thought that even if I don't get the recession I was calling for, but I get demand growth slowing below supply growth, we're still going to build up uh, disinflationary or deflationary pressures. And that will be good news actually for the treasury market and be good news actually for gold because as rates go down, gold will go up. And that's really been my prevailing view. It's very interesting that even going into the coronavirus, looking at the GDP numbers, in countries now like Australia, South Africa, uh, China, Japan, uh, I would say that, look, Canada was borderline. I mean, our economy was flat uh, in the uh, fourth quarter. Uh, but 30% going into the coronavirus, 30% of global GDP was already contracting. And here in Canada, we've had a bit of a consumer debt problem. You know, it's interesting because it's not just consumer debt. Of course, that gets a lot of the, uh, the press, the household debt. Uh, you know, we all lament about uh, the lack of uh, credit quality in the U.S. corporate sector. We all talk about that. Well, the last cycle was about U.S. households and mortgages. This cycle was about corporates. The corporate debt to GDP ratio in the United States is 50%, never been that high. Guess what? In Canada, it's 75%. You know, we all bellyache about the government sector. Do you know that in the Canadian corporate sector, this is not a well-known fact, the Canadian corporate sector has the same debt to GDP ratio uh, as the government sector does. Yeah. Yes, but the difference is that the government sector has the capacity to, to print tax money. That will tax the tax, tax and print yeah. money. Yeah, and so um, and that's I think why the Fed and the Bank of Canada uh, are so nervous and why they cut rates uh, so aggressively. And the Fed will keep on going. Um, you know, we all know that this coronavirus is a is a shock that central banks. Um, aren't really well equipped uh, to deal with. But no. I think what they're concerned with the most are the, the second round impacts. This the is financial happen. impacts. Well, the, what happens here is that, you know, people have it, they, they have it backwards in a sense. People tend to think that a bubble somehow bursts and that causes the recession. No, 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 no. The recession is what causes the bubble to burst. And then you get the knock on impact. Uh, that's what happened in the early 90s with commercial real estate. The recession caused the implosion in commercial real estate. Next thing you know, the United States is formulating uh, the Resolution Trust Corporation to clean up the mess and the Fed's taking the funds rate from nine and seven eighths percent down to three. Uh, you know, you go back to the last cycle, for example, Bear Stearns went down uh, in the winter of, uh, of, of 2008. The recession already started December of 07. It's the recession that causes the impairment uh, to cash flow. Cash flow needed to do what? Cash flow needed to service the debt. And I think that's why they're cutting rates so dramatically. Is to Get ahead of it. We'll try and keep at least, you know, if not the marginal company, to keep companies that do ha are going to be facing an onerous debt servicing calendar uh, to give them as much grease in the wheels as possible to get through this period. Because if we go to a recession, which I think is less likely now at this point, cash flows, cash flow growth goes negative. In fact, you're seeing it already in corporate Canada, by the way. You talk about the debt. You know that, that corporate debt in Canada has gone up 10% in the past year. But guess what? Operating revenues in corporate Canada have only gone up 3%. So it's not just a situation where debt to GDP, GDP has got a lot of stuff in it. But corporate debt to revenues uh, is over 1.5 times, never been this high before. So actually, it's not often the case. It's what people aren't talking about that matters the most. The corporate debt bubble in Canada is even higher than it is in the United States. And this is a big problem because if you go through a delinquency default cycle or a downgrade cycle, 
companies are not going to be hiring a lot of people. They're probably doing what the banks are doing right now and letting people go. Then that has a knock-on impact on what? Uh, on incomes and on spending. Uh, and that's where you get that negative feedback loop that mm-hmm. economists talk about sure. on the economy. Yeah. yeah. So they're just trying to avoid the, the markets themselves from gumming up the way they did in 08, cause even a greater problem. That's right. That's exactly what's happened the past few cycles. You see, this is part of the problem with these cycles. These aren't the cycles. Like when I went to school, in the 70s and 80s, you learned about the business cycle, and you learned about the inventory cycle, and you learned about the inflation cycle. And you know, you get the inflation, and the, the central banks raise rates, and they cause a recession, and uh, consumer spending on durable goods goes down, business spending on capital spending goes down. Uh, then with the demand destruction, you get, oh, well, inflation comes down, the central banks cut rates with a lag, uh, aggregate demand comes back in GDP, and it's just like a sine wave. But since Alan Greenspan um, became chairman in 1987, Things changed. I mean, uh, you know, he was actually the first Fed chairman that was a private sector guy uh, and uh, was not really a classic uh, central banker. Uh, But, you know, that's when we got the term Greenspan put, when he kept on pumping the system of liquidity, uh, cutting rates well after the stock market crash ended back in October of 1987, which is when I started in the business. Yeah. So anyway, that's what happened is that that was the start. The past 30 years have been these recurring cycles of asset accumulation and debt accumulation, asset inflation and rapid debt accumulation. And so these are all, these are balance sheet cycles. And that's why when we go through these recessions, you don't get the V-shaped recovery that you had, did back no. in the 50s, 60s, 70s. It much takes more a, U-shaped. T- much more U-shaped. And, and it will be this time around too. I think that's what the markets are telling you in the, ba- in the past couple of days is they're giving up on this notion that we're going to have V-shaped fly recovery. right back. Yeah. Yeah. No, we agree. So what does it mean? I mean, let's talk about rates. Uh, my next question that I had here, and it's segueing perfectly to where we are, is is your outlook for rates in North America. Will we join the party of either zero or sub-zero rates around the world? Because it really looks like, especially given the, the concerns you just flagged on the corporate credit side, uh, we may need very, very low rates to keep the system liquid through this recession. Right, well, look, you, you have negative yields out to the 10-year ten-year part of the curve in a, in a whole bunch of countries uh, yeah. in Europe and in Japan. And even in places like Germany uh, and Switzerland, um, you have negative yields out to the long bond. Yeah. Well, the way I think about it is that was the rest of the world going to play catch up to U.S. rates or were U.S. interest rates going to play catch down to the rest of the world? And I think it's pretty obvious what's happening right yeah. now. The reality is it's a game of dominoes. Europe followed Japan. We're following Europe. I can't say for sure that we'll go to negative yields out to the 10-year, but at 0.9% right now, uh, you can't. You certainly can't rule it out. There's, there's nothing really arithmetic about it. I know that it's this topsy-turvy world, and you know how exactly you do valuations uh, when rates go negative. Uh, the time value of money. I mean, something that you know we've been. Uh, you know, adhering to as financial analysts and investors uh, for decades, and we turn that topsy-turvy. But the starting point on inflation globally has never been as low as it is today. We've never had such a low cyclical peak in inflation. Uh, in the last cycle in 2006 and 07, global inflation peaked at 4%, uh, and then it came down. But at least we had a cushion. We have no cushion this time. So when people say, well, um, do negative interest rates, do they make any sense? Well, remember that one of the critical components of that are inflation expectations. People do their analysis on real interest rates based on the year-over-year percent change in the CPI or the core CPI, but that's not how it's done. Theoretically, it's about inflation expectations, which are inherently unobservable. But I'm saying that if you take a look and see what inflation does in a recession, even in the 1970s, inflation goes down every recession. And we have no cushion. I don't see any doubt that we go into a deflationary environment, which of course will have its own consequences considering the level of leverage we have globally, especially in the corporate sector. So my sense is that what are rates going to do? I think the Fed's going down to zero at a minimum. Of course, I think there'll be more rounds of quantitative easing and they'll use other items in the non-conventional toolkit. Uh, that I have no doubt. What people have to know is that, you know, there's nothing magical here. You know, if uh, we were at 3% of the 10-year note, I'd probably say, well, based on my analysis, we're probably going down to one. I'd say we're going down 200 basis points. 
or if I say to you right now, we're going down two basis points, that would be like minus 1.1 on the 10 year note if my math is correct. That is what I'm, but what I'm saying is that we have to be braced for it. We have to be braced for that we can go to zero, go below zero, it's happened overseas. And we have to entertain the thought that we're at the peak of the cycle. I mean, it was just on February 20th, we hit the peak of the stock market. It was just a couple of months ago, we hit three and a half percent on the unemployment rate. And this is where interest rates are. I'm pretty sure that if I told you, not today, but if I told you even two months ago that the 10 year treasury note yield was 1.85%, uh, you'd be thinking, well, we, we must be in a recession already. Already. Right. And we're not even in the recession yet. And inflation and interest rates go down in every recession, even in the hyperinflation in the 1970s, cyclically, in the three recessions that we got in that period, interest rates came down across the curve. So, you know, people will say to me, and they do say, well, now that you've actually met your interest rate forecast 12 months early, what are you going to do? Well, I'm not going to take a victory lap because there's no room for arrogance in this business, that's for sure. But I know that the odds of a recession happening now are higher and interest rates always go down in a recession. And there's nothing magical really about going to 0.4, 0 0.20. And Europe and Japan have taught us that already. So I think rates are going to go down further. So that uh, segues into my, my next question perfectly because I've had many chats with, I've been lucky to have many chats with strategists like with yourself and Don over the years. And um, as you know, the longer you stay close to zero at interest rates, many of the people and governments and businesses out there forget about the absolute amount they're borrowing and only look at the payments that they require to make to make their borrow and, and debt balloons even more over time, the longer you stay down there, even at the other end of a recession. So the question I got is, is, is there an eventual path to a normalized type of rate? Is there a path or types of paths that could get us eventually off zero on the other end of the cycle? Mm -hmm. Or so what would the path look like or be most likely to, to happen to get us somewhere normal in the future? Yeah, it, it, look, it, it's a, it's a, look, it's a great question. And it's a complicated question as to uh, what actually goes into the natural interest rate to begin mm. with. Uh, it had already been coming down for decades. What I found actually interesting was that when Jay Powell took over in January 2018, he kept on talking about the need to normalize interest rates. Mm -hmm. He kept on talking about the need to normalize interest rates. At that point, the Fed's estimate of the neutral rate in nominal terms was 2.5%. He was he, convinced he, he, everybody he was going to lead everybody he, off zero. Well, well, I'm talking about like in nominal terms, yeah. so not not real nominal two and a half, but right away he took it up to three, and um, harped a lot about the need to get to neutral. On October third, two thousand eighteen, um, and this is what got him in trouble with Donald Trump's uh, uh, Twitter account was when he said, "Not only do we have to." go to neutral we have to go above neutral. neutral and that would have been going above three percent now we know what happened next they raised rates in december the, the, the curve you know the the the, the stock market uh, had the trap door open up underneath it there was not a high yield bond issued for 41 days which had never happened before and then of course he cries uncle the pal pivot who thought they're going to cut rates three times and then embark on quasi uh QE4, yeah. uh, who was thinking about that? But there's a great learning lesson here, and it, it will come down to answering your question, but I think that people have to understand how, not just unusual, but how pathetic it is that the peak in the Fed funds rate this cycle, the U.S., the U.S. economy, the bright light, the cleanest shirt in the laundry basket, as they say. Well, I guess that shirt's pretty soiled on a relative basis, right? The one-eyed man is king in the land of the blind. The one-eyed man is king. And maybe the United States is the one-eyed king, <laughs> but it's still the best of the lot. Could only see the policy rate get to 2.5%. The last time that happened, the last time you had such a low cyclical peak in the policy rate was the 1930s. 30s. Yeah. yeah. Where they so, raised it well, very well, abruptly and well, well, yeah. caused and it, a recession it, it, really quickly. And in answer to your question, it's it's the learning lesson because you learn a lot. Yeah. Is that normalizing interest rates in an abnormal economy produces abnormal results. And I think we're finding that actually the natural rate is even lower. I've done a lot of work on this myself, and that the natural rate is lower than one percent. The natural is lower than 1%, which actually would mean that it's actually close to zero in real terms. 
And that's an incredible thing to say. And how do you get to that conclusion? Well, there's the real rate and there's inflation expectations. And the real rate's been driven lower by the fact that we had no productivity growth this cycle because there was no capital deepening. That's the hallmark. When, when people say to me, how come you just, you're not as bullish as the other economists or strategists? Well, they were saying that back when I was back at Merrill from 02 to 07. And we were, we were creating this artificial cycle based on home prices. And then the ability to, to yeah, to stick your credit, to stick your uh, banking card into your house and, uh, you know, and, and extract money out of it at, to use to go on vacations or to buy another car. I mean, that wasn't income from the job. That was capital gains that can come or go from your house. And we saw that happen. We acronyms like mortgage equity withdrawal, cash out refinancing, the savings rate, the way they defined it back then, because it's been changed, actually went negative. And I thought this makes no sense. But you know what? I was from the Flat Earth Society for so long. Nobody wanted to hear about it until we had to hear about it. Well, this time around, what happened this time around is we had this gargantuan amount of debt. And this is the perfect symmetry. The Fed does $4 trillion of quantitative easing, where they're taking all these safe assets out of the system, putting it on their balance sheet, and creating this vacuum. The vacuum filled by what? The vacuum filled by $4 trillion of corporate bond issuance. Now, when I went to school and you would learn about floating bonds to do something with it, corporations normally would use it on capital expenditure. Yes. Didn't happen to cycle. Share buybacks. Well, share buybacks. That's really, that's what I'm trying to tell people to understand this is a different sort of financial engineering as right, we had last cycle. The, the stocks it, all the time. Yeah, it was, it was, well, it's basically, look what it did. It, the, the stock market ended up becoming like a commodity on supply and demand. We took the S&P 500 share count down to a 20 year low. And of course, we're looking at earnings per share, dollar levels of earnings. When you look at the national account numbers from the GDP, the dollar level of earnings in the U.S. has not budged for five years. Oh, oh, oh but earnings per share have gone up. Uh, yeah, because you're taking the share count down. So all this really was was a um, financial engineering in the sense of the most acute debt for equity swap of all time. We just basically re rejigged, uh, restructured uh, the capital structure in terms of debt and equity. It didn't go into capital expenditure. So productivity growth recedes. That affects the real interest rate. Aging demographics, like if I were to tell you that we would go into a new baby boom right now, okay, we're going to have population growth accelerate right now. Well, that's, that's going to take time, right? But demographics in most parts of the world, China, mostly industrialized world, aging demographics, that leads to higher savings and that leads to lower real interest rates. So that's why, so there's these, these factors at play, whether it's demographics, uh, whether it's um, it's 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 the fact that we also have too much debt. That's and that's the lesson really is that interest rates can't go up for very long, if at all, uh, because you have to service that debt. And when you have a three hundred and twenty percent global debt to GDP ratio, even small changes in interest rates one well, percent is a big move. That was well, that finances who, who, and governments. Who thought we'd get stopped out at two and a half in the U.S.? Like I said, there's just too much. To, and of course, other central banks didn't even raise interest rates because they can't without creating a lot of other problems. So in answer to the question, when you look at the excess of debt, the aging demographics, the lack of capital formation, which has impaired productivity growth in most parts of the world, by the way, that leads to this fundamental lower real interest rate. And then you compound that with the decline we're seeing in inflation expectations. Now, I just looked at the Bloomberg terminal before coming on uh, your webinar. I see that uh, we're down to like, 1.4 on the 10 year inflation break even? Yeah. Now, I do think we'll come out the other side and we can talk about that. But for the here and now, you've got lower real rates, lower inflation expectations, and that's gonna spell even lower interest rates. They're gonna go down even further. And by the way, if, if bonds are a part of your uh, uh, portfolio, there's some big capital gains to be had because uh, the long bond, has generated a 40% return. Most equity people don't know that. Most equity people, this is what I found in the business, that bond market people, they know equity math. They can do a dividend discount model. They know how to do uh, you know, net free cash flow estimates. But I find that the equity guys don't know bond market math and the power of convexity at these low levels of interest rates. The long bond, the long bond. And, well, that's why that's that's why my, my investment thesis for the past year you know, and this is for people that say, oh, he's just a perma bear. I don't care about perma bear or perma bull. I care about making people money. <laughs> and you know what? You can actually make money 
without being long equities, even in a bull market in equities. Because the bond uh, bullion barbell has been a phenomenal pair trade over the course of the past 12 months. Well, and then I think um, next we should probably get on to gold itself and our outlook. Uh, many of us and me have a view uh, based on how low rates we really think are going to be and what gold represents, but we're not here to hear my view. We're here to hear what you think. So why don't you give us your outlook for gold? Very bullish on gold. And, and let's face it, we're, uh, you know, uh, you know, and, and people keep on asking me about, well, you know, but gold, it's had such a nice run and is it overdone? I mean, um, the S and P 100 hit a peak. The Dow hit a peak, the Nasdaq hit a peak. A new record peak, multiples of what it was well, before. We haven't even gone to a peak in gold. So I tell people, I, and people tend to forget. People tend to forget that eight and eight and a half years ago, gold was sitting just under nineteen hundred an ounce. We're not even at a peak yet. Point number one. Point number two is central banks who have very deep pockets are increasingly diversifying out of U.S. dollars and into gold. But more fundamentally. What is the near perfect inverse correlation is between interest rates and gold? Because of course the coupon is the opportunity cost of holding gold. Now, now if you want to actually have a safe asset, you're not being penalized by owning gold instead of a treasury. Where when treasury you, now is like uh, the, the I mean the real the real rate, the real the, the real yield, the real yield on the 30 year bond. Is down to six basis points. It's actually ten-year real yields negative 40, 10, uh, five year real yields negative sixty basis points, and we haven't even seen the bottom yet. And that is the inverse correlation. And this is global. It's a, just a matter of what currency do you want to have have on the other side of the trades? That's because right. what impressed me about gold in the past couple of months was that it was making new highs or approaching highs in almost every currency. And that's when you know that this fundamental structure has changed. This is a bona fide bull market. This is not just something that you say, oh, well, oh, but of course gold's going up, uh, the U.S. dollar's going down. No, no, no. It's in yen terms, in euro terms, Canadian dollar terms, sterling terms, and not every one of these currencies have been doing altogether that badly. It's just that gold has been maintaining its value. And because it is a currency that's no government's liability they can't print more of it like that's they right. can and that's and, and and the beauty here is this we will come out of this down the road okay with inflation we will have a policy that the central banks around the world uh will get even more aggressive and they have not done the big bomb they fell short of that which was debt monetization that's outright printing money quantitative easing was brand spanking new in 2008 but that's printing excess banking reserves. Yes. That didn't create the inflation because money velocity kept money on going down. Money velocity went right straight down. Yeah. But when they do the debt jubilee, and it's got biblical connotations because you can take this back to Deuteronomy and Leviticus in the Old Testament. Uh, as, um, as I turn a little uh, uh, religious on you here, but um, we are going to go through debt monetization. That is the other side. We're going to have to basically... Uh, have a bonfire of the vanities and burn this debt. And once we get the global debt GDP ratio down, and it's a different form of defaulting, it's the more benevolent way of defaulting. Yes, this will be austerity is not the net, uh, well, not the fun way. Austerity and, 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 no, and taxpayers won't vote for right. that. And of course, inflation runs both ways. It, it hurts and it helps some people. Um, but I think that's where we're going to come out of this. And it could be in the next year. And I'm on guard for it because I will be out of bonds at that point. And inflation will go up. And so I'm taking this back to gold. Why? Why? Can you imagine if I told you that the 10-year tip break even, the heartbeat of inflation expectations in the bond market was at a cycle low of 1.4%. You say, well, gold's the last thing that I want. Well, you want to own gold for different reasons right now. And that's because, well, it's a hedge against this elevated uncertainty we have, especially with the coronavirus. So gold is a safe haven working out very nicely. But it's really just what we talked about before, which is that the, the perfect inverse correlation or near perfect with interest rates. Inflation hasn't even gone up yet. 
Now, maybe it will actually, we don't know. We know that the coronavirus is both a demand shock, but we also know it's a shock on supply chains. It is. And we know there's going to be runs on drug stores and food stores. They're already and, and starting. Already starting. So, and, and so there might be some inflationary impulse coming out of that. It's both, I guess you would say, inflation, deflation mixed in together. But the reality is that the markets have determined that the deflationary forces are more powerful. more powerful. It's very interesting because when you look at the bond market this year, say the 10-year Treasury note yield, you'll see that two-thirds of the move down in the 10-year note from, say, 2% down to 0.9. Two-thirds of that move has been the real rate. And the real rates connect to real growth. So the bond market's saying we are downgrading growth prospects, but a third of it has come from declining inflation expectations. Well, imagine what happens to gold when inflation expectations go the other way. I know that's not topical right now because no. we have deflation on the mind, but that is not going to be. But we'll get there. We'll get to week. a point. And if people have a, an investment high horizon, that's exactly what we're talking about here. Yeah. We haven't even seen uh, what gold is going to do on the other side of this. Well, I don't want to pin you to a number, but is twenty five hundred out of the question? Or I, three thousand? Well, uh, three thousand. I've been talking about three thousand. And here's I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you when the trade is over. Trade is over, and this is why people are going to have to subscribe to my research because you'll know it because it, it'll say it'll 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 um, uh, it'll be changed from Rosenberg research to Greenberg to Goldberg research. Goldberg research. Yeah. Okay, it's going to be Goldberg. Well, we'll be watching carefully over at Red Cloud. So thank goodness we. Uh, we focus on the mining. It space. might be Greenberg first because they're going to print all that money. Yes, then it'll be and then it'll be Goldberg. We'll watch for the transition. <laughs> so that's terrific. So look, at this point, um, why don't we look and see what type of questions we have so that I don't get the chance to hog all of your time. Um, what percentage of a person's assets should be in gold is our first question. Mm. Well, you know, that depends on, you know, when I get questions like that, it's, 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 so, it's so personal. It's very personal. Uh, but I, I would say that irrespective of um, uh, of any other tolerance or cash flow needs, I, I would say I would, I would not have less than 5%. That would okay. be the minimum. Okay. No, that's good. Uh, I got a housing question here. What would be the ha impact on the housing market? And do you expect OSFI to further ease or scrap the B20 test? Uh, well, I, I certainly don't expect there's going to be any measures uh, to um, to get rid of the B20 test. I do think that the Bank Canada is going to continue to cut interest rates. I think that's obvious to me. And I don't think they're going to mind uh, having uh, the housing market actually continue to be strong uh, to offset, even, well, to offset a lot of the weakness we're going to have in other parts of the economy and they'll deal with any bubblicious factors afterwards. Uh, so the answer to the question is that, um, yeah, is, is that uh, I, I think, I think housing and I say in, a, in the United States as well, uh, probably because of their intersensitivity will be good places to be. There's no natural way to play it in Canada, except to say that I think that um, residential REITs, residential REITs both sides of the border, have been by the way they've been quite strong they've been quite good diversified REITs again uh just like gold those are yield plays of course they're uh positively correlated but I actually had sam zell on cnbc this him. morning he yeah. was great and he was saying that in the us he wasn't speaking about canada the love the leverage used in a lot of those REITs is actually lower than normal because they blew up last cycle so right. badly so right well that's the thing that in, the, in an uncertain environment uh where you have deflationary pressures uh and a Overall, high and rising level of economic uncertainty, microscopic interest rates, you want to treat your portfolio, you treat your investments as though you're a landlord. You want to be a landlord with high quality tenants. So you want, that's what I'm saying, you want to barbell your gold with investments that are going to spin off a reliable cash flow stream. So REITs will be, I think, a sound place to be. Okay. Or, or any area that gives you a, a sound dividend. And it's stable, at least stable, yeah. even not growing. So another question here, what's the leading indicators that you look at to tell you you're right and which ones to tell you you're wrong? Mm, that's, a, uh, that's a great question. Uh, I used to believe in the yield curve. And uh, I used to tell people that if I was alone on a desert island, and a lot of people wish I was, uh, that um, the yield curve would be my favorite indicator. But 
it's at microscopic levels of interest rates, the yield curve loses its allure as a leading, as a leading indicator. Uh, we already had a couple of recessions in Japan this cycle. You know, we talk about the 11 year economic cycle. Uh, well, Japan had two recessions. In the middle of it. Guess what? The yield curve didn't invert. Uh, Europe had a recession, by the way. The euro area had a recession uh, seven years ago. Uh, the curve didn't invert. Best leading indicator. The best leading indicator is the long bond. The long bond. Not the yield curve, but the, just the long just bond. Just the direction. The direction of. You can look at 10s, look at 30s. The direction of long-term interest rates has got so much power, so much power. It's telling you, it's telling you that we are in the midst of a global supply glut. It's telling you about accelerating deflationary pressures, which is actually quite pernicious considering how much debt we have and the impairment to cash flows and then that what mean what that could mean for uh, defaults, delinquencies, and downgrades. It's, look at, we've been through this before. It's been a long time, mind you, but it's just the cycle. The cycle is a cycle, and the credit cycle and the economic cycle are joined at the hip. Uh, so uh, I would say that the most powerful, so I'll tell you what, uh, if the long bond yield starts to go up, and I see that it's going up for the right reasons, it's going up because we're having an inflationary situation coupled with accelerating growth, I will let the long end of the bond curve tell me that I'm wrong. And right now it's telling me that I'm right, so I'm going to stick with the story. But that is actually the best leading indicator right now. Okay. There's a Canadian dollar question. Yeah, you, yeah. go ahead There's on the um, Canadian dollar. Well, where, where do you see the Canadian dollar going and how far? Well, look, Canada Canada is 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 a is a torque on the global economy. The global economy, I think, is going into recession. I already said before that 30% of global GDP, again, something people don't realize, has already gone into negative growth. Uh, Canadian dollar is going to be going down. I mean, how far? I mean, a lot will depend on how much more the Bank Canada is going to have to do relative to the Fed. Uh, a lot is going to have to do with how far commodity prices, which, by the way, in, in relative terms, I mean, as everything else is making new lows, commodities have hung unreasonably well. Uh, they, but, they may not and, be a good indicator this time because we've had a whole decade being a guy in a mining industry. Yeah. We've had an entire decade here where there's been very little supply response yeah. in any commodity for the decade. So there's right. just not, you know, we normally in normal cycles, like you talk about all those old economic cycles, by the end of the economic cycle, when everything's rolling, you've had a lot of supply about to or come on in the main commodity areas really haven't had that this time. You know, it was my, my one attempt to try and say something positive and you pulled the rug. Sorry, I said it for you. I'm but, sorry. No, but, it, but I think we're both in agreement. I, I'm bearish on the Canadian dollar. I have been. I, I think that if you're going to say to me, you know, where do I think we'll, we'll get to in the next few months? I think we're going to get to 140. Okay. And then and then look for it to potentially rebound out the other end if the global if you see signs of the global economy coming back to that, that's that's what we have to there's actually a very interesting uh, indicator someone talked about leading indicators called the OECD leading indicator and because Canada is a torque on global growth and so is the Canadian dollar uh, when that bottoms out and starts to hook up I'll probably turn more bullish on the Canadian dollar but I don't expect I don't I do not expect that to happen in the next six months okay. um, we have a question I mean I don't know if you really follow silver all that much yeah uh, does your view on gold uh, uh, reflect that of silver as well well it's interesting that you know you, you look at gold and gold is hung on remarkably well in this uh tumultuous market backdrop over the course of the past say uh month silver's corrected uh it's like how i look at um look at the chart of uh palladium and then look at the chart of platinum and it's very similar uh platinum is corrected pretty hard palladium hasn't and I just use those as uh, as examples because what platinum and what silver have in common is they have a lot more industrial properties. Mm -hmm. They have more uh, sensitivity to the economic cycle than gold does. Um, I like precious metals uh, as a group, uh, but I like gold relative to silver. Uh, and I think that because of its relationship with interest rates, it's non-relationship with the global economy, gold will continue to outperform silver uh, over the course of the next several months. 
and not just gold, but also gold miners. Um, but I think that is actually going to be where your concentration should be. You shouldn't look at silver that it's corrected, oh, and that the gold silver ratio has gone up, and I want to allocate more to silver. I wouldn't be thinking about it that way. Uh, silver is is acting the same way, uh, with maybe a lower degree of sensitivity to what the other industrial metals have been doing, which is not too great. No, not as well. Um, we've had a, a couple of questions on the feed here, just talking about gold stocks relative to the gold price that a that they've been underperforming, and you have sort of a view on what you see with the gold mining stocks. Because at the end of the day, their selling price is tied to yeah whatever gold does yeah. Well, look, it's the same thing in some sense. You know, the, the oil price had been uh, had been uh, picking up in the past, say, a few weeks in the lead up to the OPEC meeting, and uh, and the ener and the energy stocks haven't been following suit either. So, so there's this disconnect. Uh, I always thought that the gold mining stocks, you know, um, had uh, had the leverage, had the torque. If you were bullish, why buy, buy physical gold? You know, buy buy the mining stocks and get get the multiple. Uh, and uh, it could well be that. Um, that the one thing we have to keep in the back of our mind when we're talking about gold mining stocks is that they will still be part of the equity market. They'll still going to equity stocks. And, and so, and that's right. So you're still buying part of the stock market. And so, when index funds have to sell, of course, well, they're going to be selling the 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 mega uh, cap uh, growth stocks more. But you're really selling everything. When you're selling an index fund, you're selling everything. And so that's one of the things holding back, uh, say, the gold mining group. But it is an area I think that looks very interesting to me. Terrific. Well, I think on that, we might uh, we might wrap it up. So thanks, everyone, for listening in. We appreciate all the questions. And David, thank you so much for the inaugural Red Cloud webinar. We really appreciate your time. It was an honor being here. Thank you. Thanks.